Hello, Rim of the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize, and the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 348. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake. I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hi, guys. So good to be here talking to you. Uh, we've been watching the building this last week, and wow, are they making real progress. Making progress. And they've even uh, started some of the work on phase three. Oh, on the gym, yeah. And so it's so encouraging. It's so beautiful. Can't wait to take some pictures and show you. Going to wait till they get the, um, the kitchen set up to take some pictures, but they, they put the stalls in the new bathroom, one of them, and it just looks so great in there. I'm just so thankful to God and thankful for all the partners uh, that are helping bring this to pass. We're going to have mighty miracles at this center. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, I feel like we've, we've passed um, some kind of a, a strategic point in the spirit realm once we got past this last weekend. Uh, and I always sense that, that there are, this is a miracle time because, you know, that's, that's when I start reading um, the book of Acts. And I get so encouraged when I read about what happened there. But I think um, what I sense in my spirit is that we're going we're gonna to start seeing greater miracles than we've ever seen. And, and we've been anticipating that for a long time uh, because the Word says that there will be greater works in the last days and so we're so encouraged and uh, i just have such an anticipation for what god's going to do at the conferences you know one of the things that i've been sensing you know that i I have shared for years that there are ebbs and flows to the moving of god Mm -hmm. and you know when uh, when the tide's out that's when we press into god and i know the remnant have been doing that and one of the things is as i've been praying yesterday i was over walking at the center and uh, Mary, I've got to confess. Every time I go over there, I, I peek into the and because they got the flooring down, so I peek into the kitchen, saying, "Got appliances yet?" You know, <laughs> and just so excited about that. But as I was over there walking yesterday and praying, uh, God was saying, "The tide's coming in," and uh, we're we're getting. I, th- I think we're getting ready to enter into a period of of high tide of the presence of God and the yeah. power of God coming in. That's actually confirmation of. Uh of someone else I listened to that said that earlier this week I hadn't even mentioned to, but that I absolutely believe that. Uh, you know, it looks like like that everything's just going to yeah. hell in the handbasket. Yeah. But I am telling you, God's got a plan. And, you know, it, I was oh. reminded of Second Peter 3, 9 this week. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And see, that's what this this is about, guys. It is. You know, I know I've had those feelings in the past, though. You know, over the last almost 30 years, I just think, oh, God, you've got to do something with this evil. And, and you know, there's there's there are going to be um, Saul's that become Paul's. There are. There are people that are... are thinking they're doing God's will, and, and they're going to come out of that. There are people in the occult that are going to see the truth. You know, we can't see everything God's, God sees, and sometimes you just look at this and just think, oh, my goodness. But, you know, God's had to prepare an army. Yes. This, it takes an army to fight this level because we're, we're working against Nephilim that have been infiltrating the minds of people, uh, have definitely infiltrated the education system in our nation. Oh, there's a, in, in fact, you know, every once in a while I mention books that, uh, that I think are pertinent to what's going on. And there's one that, that came across my radar. In fact, a woman uh, brought one to every board member uh, at, for her local school district. And, uh, of course, she had progressives on there, and it caused such havoc they had to shut down the board meeting, and it's called Race to the Bottom. And it was showing how progressives have literally taken our educational system from what used to be the number one educational system in the world. Mm-hmm. And they have brought it down to where I think we're ranked, what, like 30th in the world or something like that. And guys, this this is, has been on purpose. 
And so if you can pick up that book, you know, this, this is something we need to bring to our, our, our local school boards and stuff. Well, that's to, one of to the... open their eyes. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, as you were sharing, you know, you feel like, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Mary, that's exactly when we need God's power to be at high tide. It's, it's not during the good times. And what you see throughout the Bible is, and I, I love the verse in the Psalms, and we would and the King James I think puts the comma in the wrong place because in the Hebrew the comma is not there, so it's it's an you know an interpreter's uh, prerogative where they put it. But, but the Bible says when the enemy comes in, comma I think that's where it should be, like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. Yeah, because I've been hearing for a long time it's going to be a tsunami of God's power. Yes, I mean years I've been hearing that and believing and declaring it, and uh, you know the educational system was one of the nine points that God told me years ago that was going to be judged. And at that point, um, I knew that there was, you know, secular teachings in the colleges that were against God's word and things, but I had no clue of what was coming. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about um, a plot that the enemy put in place that I think that we can all pray and see it fall to pieces. But Praise God. Uh, one of the things I saw this morning that, that is confirmation that that this needs to come down. It was um, a news feed that said that YouTube removed an interview with Tucker Carlson and this young woman that had transitioned um, from a female to a male, and she's detransitioned uh, as she got to the age of 23. This happened when she's 15. It says during the interview, Helena Kirshner described how she feels she was exploited at a time when she was young, Confused and uncomfortable in her own skin. How many young people feel that, Mike? All of them. That's, that's, uh, called, I mean, that's I, called being a teenager. That's right. And says, Kirshner uh, has said she felt sucked into gender ideology online at age 15 and was even encouraged by officials at her school to undergo masculinizing hormone therapy in a process she describes as very damaging. Well, you can see why YouTube took that off. You can't have that on there telling the truth about what's really going on with these kids. You know, there's a, I may have mentioned this before, but it just is, is so heartbreaking. There's a, a very tall man in Springfield, Missouri, and he walks a lot out there. And, and he obviously has transitioned to a, a female. But it's, it's, you can just see sadness on him. And it's, I just think, God, what have they done to the people? There's, there's been such a confusion that, that has been loosed, and and we're going to pray about that here, here a little are. bit because God gave me some insight to that years ago, and I think this is the time for it to break. Um, well, you know, one of the things, can I can I interject this that God shared with me yesterday too? Mm -hmm. um, the spring feast is a season of a double portion of the power of God. Yes. Because you put Passover with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and you have the Passover anointing that brings down Pharaoh, and you have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that causes hope to mm -hmm. rise mm -hmm. and faith to rise out of an impossible situation that can overcome hell, death, and the grave. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that one of the things that um, those of us who understand our Hebraic heritage, before we separated those, okay, uh, I remember, you know, growing up as, as a Baptist boy, no one ever talked to Passover. It's just, you know, that's, that's, oh, that, no. that's that Jewish stuff over there. It was you never take mentioned. the power of bringing down Egypt and bringing down Pharaoh, and the resurrection of Jesus was a death blow, yeah. a death blow. To the kingdom of darkness, mm -hmm. where he took back the keys. You put them together. This this is why the rim that are beginning to understand their Hebraic heritage. You put them together, and you have a double portion anointing to bring down the influence of the Pharaoh of this world and the new world order, and everything that they're doing in the lives of the remnant when we put it all together and we stand in faith. 
There is a double portion yeah, anointing right. that God is getting ready to release. That's right. That's but you say, well, why doesn't this happen before? You got to understand. You got to believe. That's it. And the, and you got to have that information. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things I want Mike to talk about here in a little bit is um, we mention it every year, but you know, it was after the Passover when Joshua went and they, the walls of Jericho fell. Yeah. Took down a Nephilim stronghold. Right, and and that's what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with the Nephilim and and instructions from them to do things that my mind can't even conceive of some of it. I I, you know, I I never have been interested in in science. Um, I was, I made straight A's as far as algebra and geometry when I took them, but I can tell you by looking back, <laughs> the people that made straight A's were the people that at least had all of the uh, criteria to have had what happened to me happen to them. And I, I think that you have to have some instruction to be really good at these things. I do, because, because the Nephilim have instructed people how to construct things in the, in the spirit realm to hold people prisoners, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute but i i agree with you mike you know it there's so many people saying that's it you know uh, there's no hope everybody's taking this shot they're all going to be dead in so many years all these horrible things let's be believing that god can remove that stuff from people but you know he can remove poison from food we we survived poisoning Mm -hmm. (laughs) he can purify your air he can purify your water mark chapter 16 okay if they if they try to poison you to shut you up from preaching the gospel, no deadly thing shall hurt you. You can bring restoration to your body. Yeah. He can heal the blind. He can restore a withered limb. God's power hasn't changed. That same power that was doing those miracles is, is here today. Do you know what I think has changed? Our expectation. Yeah. Because we have gotten so sewn into Laodicea. We have gotten so sewed into the, the medical community. And guys... Here's one thing that we need to wake up and smell the coffee. And, and guys, there are many wonderful, wonderful doctors out there. You know, I've had the privilege of, of not only having some good doctors here locally. I remember back in the uh, uh, beginning of 2001 where I had to have surgery, and God just supernaturally put me with one of the best surgeons in the area. Boy, and he was a truth. wonderful man. Yes, he was. Uh, and I've had the, the privilege of meeting people like Dr. Sherry Tenpenny and others, and so we have a lot of wonderful doctors. But they're not gods, okay? They're not gods. They, they know, and in fact, one of the, um, one of the neatest doctors I ever, I ever met in my life said, he said, listen, he said, whether I'm doing surgery or prescribed medicine, I know that only God can heal. That's right. And, and God can use he can the use medical things. community, but he can just do miraculous healings. He can, he can do because, th- I mean, there's a lot of things that God does. And uh, absolutely, uh, doctors said and scratched their heads. When I was at the Hear the Watchman conference, I got to meet a, a guy named John Jubilee. And he did a presentation with some things, and he did 10 years' worth of study on how to renew cells. And he was actually at the um, at the uh, United Nations appearing before doctors. And, I mean, he just he put, he, he has stitched, like, all kinds of stuff together that I have never heard before put together. And these doctors said, how in the world? Now, we see the logic of it. Now, we had never seen this before. How in the world did you put this together and he looked him right in the eyes he said the spirit of god showed me Mm -hmm. and see that that's the difference this because all these things god has put in into 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 nature to help us he has put into different things and guys our our hope has to be in god first and and now listen to me remnant politics second Hear me. Our hope is never going to be in Washington, D.C. with that whole mess up there. It's got to be in God. Now, God can move and put them in a headlock where they have no other choice, just like Pharaoh, to do the will of God, regardless of who he puts in the office in the future. It's almighty God that has to move and, and to force them 
many times even begrudgingly. You, do you think Pharaoh wanted to let the children of Israel go out of Egypt? That's the last thing he wanted to do. God put him in a headlock, and after he changed his mind, he destroyed his army. You know, but, but we do have a responsibility since we do vote yeah. to look for the people that are, are following God's ways. Yes. There are many, many that are running for the midterms that actually don't want abortion to continue. Yeah. And see, that that makes it much easier. God can just wipe stuff out if he wants to, but he chooses to work through people. And so we do have a responsibility to pay attention to those things and and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because there's, I think it's Janet Porter's her name, is one of the... She's running for uh, office, yeah. and she was. She has been such a proponent of showing what the abortion is and and talking to legislatures. So, and I so believe many, it's important. Well, I think one of the things this past election has done is it has woken up truly conservative, God fearing Americans mm-hmm. that uh, maybe are don't saying, vote, maybe just. Didn't vote, just, just the, I'm too busy with life to do this. And now from the local level on up, they're saying, I've had enough and I'm getting involved. Now the left, the progressives are going crazy over this because, and they'll say things like, this could be the end of democracy. No, it could be the end of what you have been doing to democracy in America. That's right. And That's right. so... Uh, and Mary, for me, that, that gives hope because I think God is the one. God is the one who stirred the hearts of all these people, whether they even know him or not, to raise up and say, I've had enough. Mm-hmm. And we're going back to the Constitution. We're going back to what is right. And uh, that gives me hope. And, and Mary, I think that is as much a supernatural move of God as what we need in the church. Mm-hmm. I really do. And I, I think it's a part of this season of people are saying, listen, these people have put us in chains and they have gotten to the place where they are, they, they have, they're, they're so outrageous in what they have done that it can't be tolerated anymore. And uh, see, that's, that's what we need to have happen to church. What the devil has done that has gotten us so far off the word that we no longer know who Jesus is. We no longer know what is right and wrong. And we literally have churches calling evil good and good evil. It has gotten to the place to where it has, it is beyond ridiculous and it can no longer be tolerated. And there is, and so it's, I think that's one of the things that causes people Mm -hmm. to cry out for deliverance, to cry out for God to move and for revival. It's like, we've, we've had enough. Look at all the years that, um, now, not, not all the years that uh, Israel was in Egypt were they under bondage because there was a time that they were under uh, the reign of the Pharaoh of, of, of northern Egypt that knew Joseph. But then when the south took over and conquered that king and there was this slow migration over into bondage. And uh, Mary, I wonder how long it took before they began crying out. I, I think the peak of their crying out was when there was a guy named Moses that was born and God says okay I've got to put something into motion because I have heard the cries of my people how long was it before they cried out and I I think that God has been stirring the nest to say it's okay it's time to cry out it's time for you to get uncomfortable in Laodicea it's time for you be it's time for you to rise up in faith and embrace what I have done for you because I'm getting ready to change some things. And one of the very one of the neatest uh, verses in in all the book of Mark. It's I think it's the very last uh, verse in Mark, and it said, "God went with them, working with them. God working with them, mm-hmm. confirming." the gospel, confirming the power of the name of Jesus with signs and wonders. God doesn't want to work for us. And this was the transition they had to do as we're, we're going to be talking about when, when they had to cross over the Jordan. 
God no longer wants to work for us. God wants to work with us. Yeah. And Jesus gave us authority to do it. Absolutely. And that's, and we, we have got to get that mindset. If God's going to do it, he's going to do it through me. If God's going to pray in revival, let him pray in revival through me. If God's going to, whatever the situation is, God, use me to accomplish your will on planet Earth. And, uh, guys, it's because God has a lot that he's got to take back, doesn't he, Mary? Yes, he does. And I I think one of the greatest miracles that we're getting ready to see is the breaking of mind control mechanisms that have taken captive several generations. And the reason that I mention uh, algebra and geometry is, of course, there are things that we have to learn about building, like angles. And, you know, there's, there's valuable information in that. I don't want to give the wrong impression that that's all, you know, for nothing. But it has been perverted by the Nephilim. Mm-hmm. Principles that, that I don't even think we're aware of, they have used to construct... The only way I know how to describe it is I can see prisons that have been built in the spirit realm that are connected to the earth that have taken generations captive through some kind of a, a Nephilim instructions in high-level occult activity. And and it holds the people in those generations in invisible geometric structures. And, it's, and they've even named them. Um, years ago, God told me that when they named like Generation X, Generation Y, or Millennials, and Generation Z, that they were they were declaring these structures that they that they had built. And Generation X would be ages forty two to fifty seven. Generation Y or the Millennials is ages twenty six to forty one. Generation Z would be ages ten to twenty five. And uh, what God told me is he was he actually gave me a song about it. And he, he said that they are to be called faithful generations. So I knew at some point that God was going to release them from prison. And, and you know, that's, that's a lot, I think, of what's going on because, you know, we've experienced it. We've talked to so many people around the world that, that family members are, are caught in, in um, some kind of a, a situation that you can't even understand. You can't understand what's going on with them. You can't understand why they can't see truth, why they are so confused. Um, you know, this, especially this last generation, Mike, uh, last two have been, that's where the confusions come in, the gender trans yeah. um, confusion. Of course, you know, well, I think what you're talking about is techno sorcery. Okay, which which we we we've, we've dealt with ever since writing the Shiner Directive, and what's interesting, and and this is something Mary didn't know, you know, when 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 I when I wrote the Shiner Directive, one of the things I, I put forth is that the Watchers really begin to prepare things in the nineteenth century to be released in the twentieth century. Of course, we see kind of a zenith of a lot of those things coming together with the Nazis, which amalgamated into everything. Um, but X, Y, and Z, that's, that's very strategic. And, and this, you know, if you're, if you're dealing from a watcher or Nephilim point of view, you're going to be dealing with three-dimensional space, okay? Uh, which anybody that has done computer programming, computer modeling, or has flown an aircraft, you know about the X, Y, and Z axis, okay? A, X, I, S, axis. That that has to be calculated whether you're traveling in air, you're traveling in space, or you're 3D modeling. Well, when you put geometric shapes into the second heaven, which relates to the soul, you're going to have an X, Y, and Z axis. So they have used these three generations, and they have targeted them. That's, I think, you know... Surely since the beginning of man, we, we, have, we have had more than 23 generations of humanity. Why these generations? Why these mm-hmm. are the X, Y, and Z? Because they have put together the technology and the uh, sorcery and the perverse psychology. Not, not good psychology, but perverse psychology in forms of mind control, in forms of, of manipulation and confusion. They knew with these three generations, they were going to create the axis to create a portal 
for the son of perdition to be revealed on planet earth. And God is saying, just like what happened when you get into Joshua. Okay, they said, this is what the people of God said when God says, cross over Jordan. You're going to take us over there so that our children will die at the hands of the Nephilim or the Raphaim. And God says, you're going to die in the wilderness, but your kids are going to inherit the Mm -hmm. land. God is getting ready to target these kids and say, you know what? You're going to be faithful generations. (laughs) I'm going to set them free, and I'm going to give you a tsunami, Jack. I'm going to give you a tsunami of, of kids that are on fire for me that have broken free of the Pharaoh of this world and the techno sorcery of Babylon, and they're going to serve me with their whole hearts because they're going to see truth. That's right. Well, and I think, see, my my generation is the one above, you know, before Generation X, and I think the mind control experiments done on my generation were part of the preparation for this. Because exactly. Because I, I don't understand it um, because I don't have the knowledge, like, about um, how you would do this. But I know it has. It involves satellites. It involves sorcery. It has to do with positive and negative charges, <laughs> and those are, are just things that just God was speaking to me. And and I can't put that together because I don't have a scientific background to to say, oh, this is what they did. But I but I believe that this is the time when it's going to break. You know, I, I was. Um, did you need to say something? No, I said we can take all this back. Remember the presentation I did for True Legends here a few years back when I deal with the beast system and how it was multi-pronged that it was going to require the Internet of Things. It was going to require implants and and uh, the uh, not 5G but, but 6G when it comes out because it's actually going to be a uh, subspace quantum Internet is what they're talking about. All these things combined – I think this XYZ thing that they have been doing is a preliminary test for what will become that B system. Mm-hmm. But before the before that whole thing goes on, God is going to set a generation free. God's going to set these generations free for the gl- great revival that's going yeah, to come. I believe it. Before all this stuff falls into place. That's right. Well, the you know just to uh, give some scriptures on what confusion does. Uh, James 3.16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Yeah. And these high-level occultists are immersed in envy and strife. They're self-centered, and they manipulate to cause strife and chaos. Oh, absolutely. We, that's, that's what we are seeing right now. In everything they're doing, it's to ca- cause chaos and yeah. confusion. But, you know, there's, there's a side of that that I, don't, that I think fits right into this, and this goes all the way back to Genesis 1-2. And it's when the earth became void, formless and void. That's tohu and bohu, which is confusion and chaos. But, Mary, when, what's interesting is when you look at, uh, when you pull up a good lexicon and you look up the, the definitions for uh, tohu, the confusion and chaos, one of the definitions is unreality, and that's exactly what this generation is in. It's an, an it, unreality. Absolute unreality. And but the good news is when Jesus said, those that abide in, my, in, my, in, in me and, and abide in my truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, Mary. And when you look up that word truth in the original Greek, one of its definitions is in reality. Jesus comes to bring reality that will supersede and overwrite the unreality established by confusion and chaos. I love that. Well, um, you know, the, if you think of the counter to confusion, it would be wisdom and understanding. So I want to mm-hmm. read a couple of scriptures for that first. In Isaiah um, 11, 1 and 2, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And then that's um, talked about again in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. It says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over uh, all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know, why that's so important, when you read Isaiah chapter 11, I, I write about this uh, several chapters in the Kingdom Priesthood book. That's the sevenfold anointing of Messiah, and it's the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that when Messiah did what he was going to do for us, he opened the door for those anointings to begin flowing into the body of Christ. And it comes with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we say, well, Mike, why have we not been experiencing that? Because you didn't know they were there and you weren't believing for them. There was no expectation. Mm -hmm. You have to have that. You need to start reading Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I want you guys to read it every day and say, Jesus, let this be manifested in me. Now, what's repeated over again, because the, the next verse says that, the Messiah would be quick. He would be alive concerning the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is mentioned more than once. The fear of the Lord opens the door. It is the, it is the supernatural key to moving in the rest of those anointings. And over and over again, the Bible says, you know, God says, come to me and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And so our prayer needs to be, Lord, teach me to fear and to reverence you. And as you do, these other anointings are going to be released. And see if it begins being released in the body of Christ, it's going to splash over to this X, Y, and Z generation yeah. and begin to set them free. That's right. And, you know, for the uh, couple of examples of God miraculously taking somebody out of prison, which these are invisible prisons, is uh, Acts sixteen twenty two, and the multitude rose up together against them. Let's talk about Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Yes. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And that's what uh, that's what we're we're looking for. <laughs> we're, yes, we you are. know, God can cause an earthquake and, and cause shackles to fall off, and He can break these invisible prisons. Yes, He can. In Acts five uh, seventeen nineteen, uh, then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, brought them forth. So, I mean, God supernaturally before has broken prison doors. And so that's what I, that we need to be believing for. We're going to pray for that. But I, first, before that, I wanted um, Mike to talk about what happened during Jericho and how this was during this time. It was after Passover. And, you know, this, this is a week. Now, <clears throat> there were a lot of people that, that have been fasting. I personally don't fast before Passover. Because I don't want to join in with where they're doing the, the, bat, Lent, the, the fasting right. for Tammuz. And yeah. but now would be an excellent time for yes. all of us to fast and pray because it's it's a um, supernatural season. It is. It's it's when you know that's what the enemy was was down. You know, it, they, can you imagine how the enemy was stumbling? After what Jesus did, I bet it took them. You know, we don't have anything to support this, but but in my opinion, I bet they were stumbling around and couldn't even get their bearings for a long time. I think he went down there and just kicked the tar out of them. Um, well, and yeah, the Bible says he made an open show with them. Now, that historically means like when a king would come in and conquer, he would bind up the king and hold his entire administration, so all the gates of hell, and he par he paraded them through hell 
as captives, saying, I have conquered. That's that, And so anybody that in, in Paul's day that read that knew exactly yeah, right. what the Apostle Paul was saying. Now, we're, we don't understand that now, but they understood that then. And let me tell you something. When Jesus rose from the dead, it's almost like when um, uh, Satan came and, and tempted Jesus for the 40 days in the wilderness, and each time Jesus basically stomped his head. And, it's, and there's this one little thing we just read over and Satan left him for a little bit. Do you know why? You know why he did? Because Satan had to recover. That's what I think. Satan had to recover, and then there's, and so there's going to be some things that are going to be happening here in the future that I believe the kingdom of hell is going to have to take a break and recover. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's talk about what happened uh, with Jericho, and. In fact, I've got a wonderful teaching on this that you can find on our YouTube channel. Uh, years ago, Gary Stearman was uh, kind enough to invite me in down when they were having the conferences in Colorado. was the first one I went to. And I taught on Nephilim secrets of Jericho. And when you, and this, this is something the archaeologists have found out, they've had to use uh, ra- uh, ground penetrating radar. The very foundations, Mary, of Jericho were monolithic stones, which always point back to Nephilim. So they had had built Jericho on the ruins of a Nephilim stronghold. That's why there was such power there that, uh, and, and, you know, when you, when you look at it, God actually had took them out of their way crossed the river Jordan where they were supposed to cross and they attacked Jericho first because it was like an occult power engine for all that the giants were doing in the promised land. And so God says, you're going to have to take this down first before you can go after the giants. Okay. So that's the kind of the background of that. And that uh, video is still available on YouTube. Uh, but let's, let's, set, let's set the stage for this. Okay, now we, we go into the book of Joshua. The previous generation had gotten, to the, had gotten to the river Jordan, made horrible false accusations against God when they had already seen God bring down the greatest nation on planet Earth at the time. Mary, this generation was at Mount Sinai when the fire of God descended on that mountain so powerfully when God spoke to them that the book of Hebrews say that it even uh, caused Moses to fear. Okay, Mm -hmm. they saw all that, and yet they refused to cross over. That generation, also while they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, griped so much against Moses and against God and that this is one of the things the sages of Israel teach, that, you know, the, the seraphim that are around the throne of God that cry out, holy, holy, holy. Now, one of the things that the sages of Israel teach was the only time that those seraphim ever stopped that is when they got so offended at what the children of Israel were saying from God, they left the throne of God and they became the fiery serpents that began biting the children of Israel. Okay, and that were causing them to die. That was the parents of the kids that were going to cross over. Okay, so they were they were raised with murmuring and bickering and complaining about God and God judging them, and, and that the whole time God is supernaturally providing for them. This Mary, just the patience of God, just sometimes blows me away. Okay, that generation dies out, all except for Joshua and Caleb. And it's time for them to cross over. And they, they've, they've crossed over. They've seen God part the Jordan. And there's what's interesting, Mary, is that generation that was murmuring and complaining against God had never circumcised their male children. That whole time, not a single one. So the first thing that Joshua does, he begins setting his house in order. Mm. You see, sometimes you got to set your house in order for the miracle that you need. You got to start returning to the word of God. Yeah. You got to start doing what you can do because when you start doing what you can do in obedience to God, it enables heaven to begin to move to do what you cannot do. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
And so the first thing they did is they went through and they circumcised all the men, okay? And they also planned it out far enough ahead that they could be all healed up before they had to go to Jericho. Smart. <laughs> Smart. And what does that represent? Reestablishing of covenant. Mm-hmm. You see, the church has not been taught covenant. We have we don't know covenant any more than the man on moose. Uh, there are things that that I hear that just so offend me for God. You know, it's like I don't have to, you know, because of grace, I don't have to take my covenant seriously because God always holds up his end. Well, haven't you read the Old Testament where eventually if you're not holding up your end, you're judged mm-hmm. by the God who you're in covenant with? Okay. When we start taking covenant seriously, it puts us into an entire different category. I, I think it's the, when we start taking that covenant seriously, with for the first time in our Christian walk, we may actually begin starting to walk in kingdom. Because you cannot walk in kingdom without taking your covenant seriously. And this is a season to say, God, teach me covenant. I, I, I want to take my covenant seriously. When when I, when I celebrated Passover, when I, when I sat there and I, I took the Lord's Supper, that my covenant that I have with you was ratified by the shed blood of Messiah. Help me live in harmony with the blood that was shed for me. Help me walk in this covenant. You see, that's what they were doing. I, we need to take our covenant seriously. We need to take the word of God seriously. Yes, this is do. not a flippant thing. This is not a religious thing. The God of the universe, the creator, wants to be in covenant with you. And he shed his own blood to bring you in covenant with him. And so they, they reestablished covenant, Mary. And then they celebrated Passover which reminded them of the great victory mm-hmm. that God had done. You That's see, right. one of the things that, that you know, every time I, I, and I've, I've read through the book of Revelation probably th- maybe two or three times in the last couple of years, and every time I do, God says, okay, now go back and read Exodus. And I'm thinking, why? Because you need to take Exodus and lay it over the top of the book of Revelation it's the same spirit that God's coming yeah. against us. Yeah, the watcher, Nephilim, Pharaoh mm-hmm. spirit. And just like God um, judged the gods of Egypt, God is getting ready to judge the principalities and powers yeah. that have erected this thing and the watchers that have erected these things over planet Earth to make this a prison planet. They've made us all slaves, whether we realize it or not. And God's getting ready to judge it. And they were reminded that without having to lift a sword, without having to lift a rock, God freed them from Egypt. Let me tell you something. Do you know what's better than the Red Sea crossing? Is when Jesus comes back on a white horse and wipes out the Antichrist, the son of perdition, and his army. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting? Now, the Bible says that when he comes back, that through that valley, that blood will flow as deep as a horse's belly, and it was a red sea that the Pharaoh's armies were drowned. Can you, can you see the types and the shadows and the prophetic there? And so they're being reminded of the might and the power of God and that there is no Raphaim, Nephilim spirit that we, that the paganism calls the old gods. Those old gods are a combination of watcher and Nephilim spirits that are still influencing planet earth. Mm-hmm. Okay. God took them down then. God can take them down now. And where they were getting ready to go, God said, I took down their daddies and their granddaddies. So what's a giant when I begin moving with my people? Yeah, and that's so, right. so they were, that Passover, Mary, began to realign them, to remind them. There's, there's, there's principles that, and Jesus said, whenever we, we take, 
the Lord's Supper, he says, do this in remembrance of me. There's power in remembering. That's right. Because we're so apt to forget. And there were, in fact, there were even strategic times. There was one time that God was so fed up with Israel that he said, Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm done with them. Instead of starting with Abraham, I'm going to start with you. And you know what stayed the hand of God, Mary? Moses stood in the gap. Mm-hmm. And he said, remember your yeah, covenant. That's right. Remember your covenant. And see, why we, why we, Passover is not only a time for us to remember the covenant. When we celebrate it, we're saying to the Father, remember your covenant. Yes, that's right. Remember your covenant. That's right. And so as they begin to partake of that Passover, not only were they were remembering, they were remembering, they were reminding heaven. We're getting ready to go to Jericho. Remember your covenant. We're getting ready to go after giants. Remember your covenant. Yes. We're getting ready to see mind control be taken down. Remember yeah, your covenant. That's right. Father, you're wanting to go after the X, Y, and Z generation. Remember your yes. covenant. Yes. There needs to be a cry of the remnant wherever they are on planet Earth. Remember your covenant, yes. Father God. Yes. Remember your covenant. And rename them the faithful generation. Rename them this. Oh, man. They can. You see, one of the things, and if have you ever read throughout the Old Testament, and especially the many of the prophetic words, why did God call Israel Jacob? You know, Jacob was his old name, okay? And he said, you know, for this for Jacob or for the descendants of Jacob, Jacob was the, was the surplanter, was the conniver. And every time I see that, Mary, I have hope because any surplanter, any conniver can become a prince of God. Well, that's right. That's right. God can turn anything around. God can turn anything around. And so when I see, and I think God uses that on purpose, to sin, and sometimes I think it's just for me when I read those, I kind of smile and I say, how about that? There's hope for me. Yeah. How about that? There's hope for me. That's right. Well, and, and so... And so God was realigning them there. He was he getting them in the position where they were not only remembering what he had done, but you see the power of the feasts are by remembering what he has done, it always empowers us for what he is going to do because they are divine rehearsals. That's right. That's exactly And I, right. I think those divine rehearsals can be prophetic throughout history as well as the ultimate fulfillment that we see unfolding in the book of Revelation. But then there's this pivotal thing that that happens in in Joshua. You see, sometimes in the conflict, and I I think this is where we need to have a paradigm adjustment. It's, we think it's about us. Isn't that so easy to do in the conflict? It's about us. It's about my discomfort. It's about my imprisonment. It's about my, it's about what I want. And so... Joshua, being the general, is overlooking Jericho, planning out what they're going to do, probably praying about it and, and wanting to know different things and, and figuring out how, you know, how am I going to get these kids to do all this and, and are they going to be able to... Because, I mean, you always have doubts and you have a lot of things when you're, when you're planning out something like this. And then this guy appears and Joshua says, Okay, Holt, whose side are you on? You on my side or you on their side? Isn't that, isn't that this human nature? You on my side, <laughs> you're on their side. And the answer he gets, he wouldn't expect. He said, listen, I am the captain of the Lord's host. Whose side you on? You have your own agenda or do you have heaven's agenda? I'm here to make sure that you align with me. That that was, a, I, I think, a pivotal place. That if I think that if he hadn't have had that, Jericho could have turned into an AI. When when they went down there and and got defeated, but instead, that that was an aha moment for him. Oh yeah, 
This is about your promises. This is about what you have declared that you're going to do. This is about what heaven wants. This is about what you want to do through your people. And so what you've been doing and helping us reestablishing covenant and remembering Passover is you're lining us back up with heaven mm-hmm. so that we can overwrite the bickering and the griping and the things that we have seen the old generation do when they missed you. You're beginning to line us back up with you so that we can overcome that to be that victorious Joshua generation. That's right. That's exactly right. And when they went down, one of the things that uh, Steve Quayle said years ago, and if you've ever studied cymatics, it's the study of the effects of sound on matter, okay, that uh, they believe that Nephilim were able to create a resonance with their sinus cavities that would create an anti-gravity field basically to help, you know, put the rocks into, into place and different things. And the more we find out about cymatics, the more plausible that is. Uh, in fact, uh, one guy did an experiment, Mary, where he took water and he would bombard it either with, uh, like, negative things or like hard rock and roll or saying pleasant things and they would flash phrases so they could see the molecular structure of uh, the water and the negative stuff and the vicious stuff it was literally losing it was losing chaos in the water molecules and they could flash freeze it and they could see it but when they spoke love they spoke faith Mm. to the water and they flash froze it it created divine order and beauty in those water. That, that's part of the understanding of cymatics. And so since the foundation was most likely set with this horrible yeah. resonance yeah. of Nephilim abs- uh, that were exerting demonic power, setting the foundation stones on which Jericho was built, Mm, that's why you had them during shout. the feast of unleavened bread they marched <laughs> yeah. around it they marched around it shouted. they marched around it and when they shouted it loosed a new resonance mm-hmm. that broke the occult power that was in the foundation stones and the whole walls fell down oh praise the name of jesus you see the sound and, and I, I hear i hear so many ministers you know god's getting ready to release a sound and they think it's going to be from a new type of music or a new type of this or a new type of that the sound that heaven is looking for is when god loses victory and the victory resonates through the voices of his people well i believe it. that's the sound that we're looking for I and of course it. we we know the story that the walls fell flat and they just walked on in and they took the yeah, city. they took it. And we're going to have to take some stuff back. We're going to have to take some things back. But we're going to have to reestablish government. government. We're going to have to reestablish by remembering what God has done because it releases hope for what he's going to do because every one of them are a divine rehearsal. And you don't have a rehearsal just for something that happened in the past. Like if you're going to have a wedding feast, what do you have the day before or a couple of days before the rehearsal? That's right. So everybody knows their place. Everybody knows what's supposed to go on. By remembering, we know our place with what God's going to do. That's right. And that as God does and God says, okay, now give a shout of victory. Begin declaring, calling those things that be not as though they were. And I think we're going to have to begin aligning ourselves with heaven, not speaking what we want, but speaking that which heaven declares. Yeah, that's it. Well, and I I believe it's the time. You know, God has a timing for everything. And I I believe this is the time that the generations are going to be taken back out of these prisons. Um, And so if it's okay with you, I'll read what God told me to say, and then you can... Say whatever, but that's what this, I was setting the stage for, baby. In the next, um, in the next week, though, I I do think that we could fast and pray till the, till we see this done. So I'm gonna start the prayer. It says, "We praise you, Almighty God, and ask that your resonance cover our voices and shake the prisons, just like in the Book of Acts and when the walls of Jericho came down after the Passover. 
We ask you to forgive every sin that has empowered the creation of these invisible prisons in Jesus' name. We ask you to send your holy angels to war against the demonic guards over the prisons. We bind the spirit of confusion over these generations and loose the spirit of understanding, wisdom, revelation, and might in the name of Jesus. We bind every spirit that is working through these structures, including rebellion, spirits of perversion, and gender confusion. And we loose the anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage in Jesus' name. We command the kingdom of darkness to let these generations go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I just ask that you would release an anointing in the remnant, Father, wherever they are in the world. Father, help us realign with the kingdom of God like never before. Let us reestablish our covenant. Father, let there be a rededication like the world has never seen to the cause of Christ, to the word of God, to the kingdom of God, that we are your children, that we are your servants, we are your bond servants in the earth. And, Father, let us align with heaven so that when we speak forth your word, it is not just man speaking forth your word, it is Jesus speaking through us to bring reality to a world filled with confusion, chaos, and unreality. Now, Father, we expect in these times yes. of, of we're, we're, we're not only expecting miracles, Father, we're expecting you to realign us wherever we need to be yes. realigned. Father, that we would come out the other end with no leaven of Babylon in us. And we expect spiritual children and grandchildren to come out of us. Yes, in Jesus' name, Father. In fact, we prophesy right now that hell cannot hold them. No. There's no techno sorcery that could ever be created in hell's greatest imagination that the power of God can't bring down in a heartbeat. That's right. And Father, loose your residence, loose your power, loose that tsunami of your power, Father, to set the captive free and to set Pharaoh back on his heels, we ask. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.